Tramps and vagabonds have made marks they make on gateposts and trees and doors, letting others of their kind know a little about the people who live at the houses and farms they pass on their travels. I think cats must leave similar signs. How else to explain the cats who turn up at our door throughout the year, hungry and flea-ridden and abandoned? We take them in, we get rid of the fleas and the ticks, feed them, and take them to the vet. We pay for them to get their shots, and indig indignity upon indignity, we have them neutered or spayed. And they stay with us for a few months, or for a year, or forever. Most of them arrive in the summer. We live in the country, just right, just the right, dis right distance out of town for the city dwellers to abandon their cats near us. We never seem to have more than eight cats, rarely have less than three. The cat population of my house is currently as follows. Hermione and Pod, Tabby and Black respectively, the mad sisters who live in my attic office and, not, and do not mingle, Snowflake, the blue-eyed, long-haired white cat, who lived wild in the woods for years before she gave up her wild ways for soft sofas and beds, and, last but largest, Furball, Snowflake's cushion-like calico long-haired daughter, orange and black and white, whom I discovered as a tiny kitten in our garage one day, strangled and almost dead, her head poked through an old, ban an old badminton net, and who surprised us all by not dying, but instead growing up to be the best-natured cat I have ever encountered. And then there is the black cat, who has no other name than the black cat, and who turned up almost a month ago. We did not realize he was going to be living here at first. He looked too well-fed to be a stray, and too old and jaunty to have been abandoned. He looked like a small panther, and moved like a patch of night. One day, in the summer, he was lurking about our ramshackle porch, eight or nine years, eight or nine years old, I guess, male, greenish-yellow of eye, very friendly, quite unperturbable. I assume he belonged to a neighbouring farmer or household. I went away for a few weeks to finish writing a book, and when I came home, he was still on our porch, living in an old cat bed one of the children had found for him. He was, however, almost unrecognisable. Patches of fur had gone, and there were deep scratches on his grey skin. The tip of one ear was almost chewed away. There was a gash beneath one eye, a slice gone from the lip. He looked tired and thin. We took the black cat to the vet, where we got him some antibiotics, which we fed him each night along with soft cat food. We wondered who we was fighting. Snowflake, our beautiful, near feral white queen? Raccoons, a rat-tailed fanged possum. Each night the scratches would be worse. One night his side would be chewed up. The next it would be his underbelly raked with claw marks and bloody to the touch. When it got to that point, I took him down to the basement to recover I took him down to the basement to recover beside the furnace and piles of boxes. He was surprisingly heavy, the black cat he was surprisingly heavy, the black cat, and I picked him up and carried him down there, with the cat basket and a litter box and some food and water. I closed the door behind him. I had to wash the blood away from my hands after I left the basement. He stayed down there for four days. At first he seemed too weak to feed himself. A cut beneath one eye had rendered him almost one-eyed, and he limped and lolled weakly, thick yellow pus oozing from the cut in his lip. I went down there every morning and every night, and I fed him and gave him antibiotics, which I mixed with his canned food, and I dabbed at the worst of the cuts and spoke to him. He had diarrhea, and although I changed his litter daily, the basement stank evilly. The four days that the black cat had lived in the basement were a bad four days in my house. The baby slipped in the bath and banged her head, and might have drowned. I learned that a project I had set my heart on adopting Hope Merrily's novel, Lud in the Mist, for the BBC, was no longer going to happen, and I realized that I did not have the energy to begin again from scratch, pitching it to other networks or to other media. My daughter f left for summer camp and immediately began to send home a plethora of heart-tearing letters and cards, five or six each day, imploring us to bring her home. 
My son had some kind of fight with his best friend, to the point that they were no longer on speaking terms, and, returning home one night, my wife hit a deer that ran out in front of the car. The deer was killed, the car was left undrivable, and my wife sustained a small cut over one eye. By the fourth day, the Count was prowling the basement, walking haltingly but impatiently between the stacks of books and comics, the boxes of mail and cassettes, of pictures and of gifts and of stuff. He mewed at me to let him out, and reluctantly I did so. I went back into the, onto the porch and slept there for the rest of the day. He went back onto the porch and slept there for the rest of the day. The next morning, there were deep new gash gashes in his flanks and clumps of black hair. And clumps of his black hair covered the wooden boards in the, of the porch. Letters arrived that day from my daughter, telling us the camp was going better and she thought she could survive a few days. My son and his friends sorted out their problem although what the argument was about, trading cards, computer games, Star Wars, or a girl, I will never learn. The BBC executive who had vetoed Lud in the Mist was discovered to have been taking bribes, well, questionable loans, from an independent production company, and was sent home on permanent leave. His successor, I was delighted to learn, when she faxed me, was the woman who had initially proposed the project to me before leaving the BBC. I thought about returning the black cat to the basement, but decided against it. Instead, I resolved to try and discover what kind of animal was coming to our house each night, and from there to formulate a plan of action. To trap it, perhaps. For birthdays and at Christmas, my family gives me gadgets and gizmos, pricey toys which excite my fancy, but ultimately rarely leave their boxes. There is a food dehydrator and an electric carving knife, a bread-making machine, and last year's present a pair of see-in-the-dark binoculars. On Christmas Day I had put, on, put in the batteries into the binoculars and had walked about the basement in the dark, too impatient to even wait until nightfall, stalking a flock of an imaginary starlings. You were warned not to turn on the light. That would have damaged the binoculars and quite possibly your eyes as well. Afterward, I had put the device back into the box and set it there in my office, beside the box of computer cables and forgotten bits and pieces. Perhaps, I thought, if the creature dog or cat or raccoon or what have you were to see me sitting on the porch, it would not come. So I took a chair, in so I took a chair into the box and cat room, co into the box and coat room, a little larger than a closet, which overlooks the porch, and, when everyone in the house was asleep, I went out onto the porch and bade the black cat good night. That cat my wife had said, when she first, when he first arrived, is a person. And there was something very person-like in his huge leonine face, his broad, thick nose, his greenish-yellow eyes, his fanged but amiable mouth, still leaking amber pus from the lower, lower right lip. I stroked his head and scratched him beneath the chin and wished him well. Then I went inside and turned off the lights on the porch. I sat on my chair in the darkness inside the house, with the sea in the dark binoculars on my lap. I had switched on the binoculars, and a trickle of greenish light came from the eyepieces. Time passed in the darkness. I experimented with looking at the darkness with the binoculars, learning to focus, to see the world in shades of green. I found myself horrified by the number of swarming insects I could see in the night air. It was as if the night world were some kind of nightmarish soup swimming with life. Then I lowered the binoculars from my eyes and stared out at the rich blacks and blues of the night, empty and peaceful and calm. Time passed. I struggled to keep awake, found myself profoundly missing cigarettes and my coffee, my two lost addictions. Either of them would have kept my eyes open, but before I had tumbled too far into the world of sleep and dreams, a yowl from the garden jerked me fully awake. I fumbled the binoculars onto my eyes and was disappointed to see that it was merely Snowflake, the white cat, streaking across the front garden like a patch of greenish-white light. She vanished into the woodland to the left of the house and was gone. 